Knöpfchen, Knöpfchen drücken. Hallo! Hallo! <lacht> moin, moin. Ja, herzlich willkommen zu den Security Nightmares, ähm, der traditionell letzten Veranstaltung des Kongresses vor dem Abschluss-Event, der sich direkt nahtlos an diesen hier anschließen wird. Wir machen das jetzt zum wievielten Mal? 14. Mal. Guck da, Sie haben schon wieder das Inventar auf die Bühne gefahren und es spricht. Aha. Wer war beim ersten Mal dabei? Cool, so viele junge Leute. Für, für wen ist es das erste Mal? Oh. Cool. Okay, wir dienen die Fohlen vom, nächsten, äh, vom letzten Jahr. Ne? Dann. Okay, wer, wer von euch ist äh, nur wegen Snowden hier? Also auf Deutsch gefragt, wer von euch ist Katastrophentourismus? Lass die Folie. Okay, video is being adjusted. Uh, four by three. Aspect ratio is preferred. Old school. So um, we had a few old buddies whom we met from different cities, and we talked about things like the first computer and, and what you kind of what you do. And uh, what also emerged, how, when did you get your first computer and how disappointed were you? And uh, one of those said, uh, my parents are, they went to a computer science teacher and asked him what to buy and then uh, I got a PC and he did want an Atari ST. And then he was sitting there uh, at this thing with its blinking, uh, with this A and the blinking cursor and asked himself. Uh, so in, in that sense, a service announcement for every, all the eight to 12 year olds that are watching and that haven't received an iPad, your parents love you. You surely were a desired child a wanted child, your parents know what they do, what they're doing. They know there are no great apps. It's not a sleek piece of hardware. There will be no updates. There, are n there is no rights management for apps. The number of viruses is, is extremely high. The Wi-Fi password is stored with Google and Heiser didn't manage in two days testing to delete it. They know all that. They want you to despair with this. They want you to install Cyanogen Mod and make the hardware your slave, not the other way around. And it is okay that the, the casing is plastic because You can reach the JTEC device easier that way, the spying device by the NSA. And it doesn't matter when the guarantee, uh, the warranty is not voided if you open the case. That is your task. Okay, you know the agenda. Um, we're talking security nightmares, those that we want, because they might change something, those we don't want, which uh, we saw plenty of this year. And well, we do want to prepare you and forewarn you together with us. And uh, sometimes we actually are right with our crystal ball observation We'll come to the review of the year, the review of the year, and uh, sometimes we think things are not moving forward. For example, if you want one, the ping of death for IPv6 or Windows versions. So
So what we found is that that saying that history keeps repeating itself, that does apply particularly in IT security. The bugs keep coming back in different form, emulators, other protocols, old stacks that suddenly become much more important. So it's worthwhile to actually uh, keep your old encyclopedic knowledge of bugs from the 90s. Don't let it waste away. You can always use it. Yeah, some a little audience survey here. Uh, browser plugins, we wanted to ask you about those, not the boring stuff such as Adblock or No Flash. Uh, everyone has that, of course. Um, something like Ghostry. Lots of hands being raised. Yeah, quite. Um, who doesn't have it? It's worth it. Open your eyes. Certificate Patrol. Uh, a quarter or even less. I didn't think it was that little. What else? Disconnect? Even fewer. Oh, at least I got the order right. Okay, now last, uh, the question that we keep asking for about 15 years, which of you has a Zigbee device? Who knows what Zigbee is? Lots of hands raised there. So uh, if you want, if you have something funny about Zigbee to tell, the microphones are here and here. And uh, if we have people at the microphones, we will actually take questions in between. Um, you have been through what many people call Christmas time, and we call it visiting the family and fixing computers. And which of you, um, as a New Year's resolution, who of you uh, intends to upgrade the Windows XP devices before April? Uh, quite a number of hands. <laughs> Go ahead and do it. And uh, ultimately, you'll just drop a screwdriver into it and say, oops, it's broken, mum. Yes. And uh, we were thinking, how can we actually uh, uh, summarize the state of IT security in 2013? It's particularly since the summer, and we came up with just one image. Well, first, the question was, we will just sit here and, and laugh hysterically for three quarters of an hour. Because, well, and then, well, if we thought an image is better than a thousand words, words and uh, here it is. Well, I think in all the time that we have done this show, it was never as much the case uh, that uh, we thought, well, actually a job, growing flowers, gardening, something with wood, would actually be And of course, it's it's a shock at first. All the things we laughed about in the Hollywood movies, it's all true. Right. I want the data of his mobile phone. Yeah. Switch all traffic that's green from here to the airport. Yeah, things like that. The front fell off. How many of you thought this year that uh, well gardening wouldn't be such a bad idea? Mm, that's almost everyone. So it's, it's this, this video with those two guys, the front fell off. And uh, what about the, in what happened to the internet? The front fell off. It just fell off. We don't know why. Yeah. So the question, of course, is why? Why? The front fell off. Okay. Now, back to the... No, why? Um, because the... Um, and why do, are they saving all that historic data as well? I don't know. 
you wanted to explain. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. Why does the NSA store encrypted data that they can get a hold of? Um, there's this, uh, you can read this up in Wikipedia, uh, a program called VNona, and uh, that's a program that uh, where the Americans uh, have all the radio transmissions that they could record from the Russians. Um, and at one point they noticed, oh, there's such a lot of encrypted radio messages, let's see what, what we can do with that. And then it happened that uh, Stalin had come to power and uh, he had a certain disturbed connection to intellectuals, mathematicians, cryptographers, which led to the fact that after many of them, enough of them have been shot or put into the uh, gulags, the, the one-time pads that they were using for the agents had to be recycled for the communication with agents, which led to the Americans um, for several years being able to uh, uh, uncover all the agent systems in the US because simply they uh, looked where th these one-time pads were being reduced. As we know with XR, it's quite easy to find the key then. A second time pad. So from that void, uh, they simply store everything because you never know. And if you think, if you consider what, uh, what are the things that we encrypt, hopefully quite a lot, and they keep storing it anyway because they hope that at some point they will be able to retrieve it. And uh, yeah, they, they say, okay, fair enough. Uh, we have been talking about all this. I think that was four years ago. I think the question, if you choose a key, for which amount of time should you choose it? Uh, is that the time of the campaign that you're actually doing, whether it's a campaign of war, how long should that last? And, and that story, fair enough. But why did they bri break it? Why did they saw off the front so that it falls down now? And you then ask yourself, how, why are they thinking that by sabotaging crypto and rotating the standards and making the internet broke for everyone, or as Bruce Schneier says, the US government has uh, been has deceived the internet, no, it's, it's not us, um, it's all the companies, the American ones too, that use this and uh, have to secure their own secrets. Do they believe that they are the only ones that are listening? Do they believe that they are the only ones that try to decrypt these things? The assumption has always been that when they break something, whether it's crypto or standards or something, they do not do it in places where it can damage themselves. Like it was in the past when crypto was an export controlled good and uh, certain software uh, products were available in three versions, one for the American market, 128 bit, one for the European market, which had whatever, 64 or 56 bit. And then of course the extra version for the French um, which they re resend, resent so that the <laughs> French Secret Service wouldn't have such a problem. There was this nice name for it, um, workload reduction field. Exactly, and, and that's how things were in the past. So you could say, okay, the American companies, they can encrypt better. Uh, but now this is uh, just failed for everyone, broken for everyone and probably because they are thinking that, um, that the others, they're, they're not as clever as we are, or they don't care. Don't they care? Well, maybe they, they just don't care. Because um, if, if you're in uh, this offense kind of frame of mind and you don't know what the others are thinking and they don't know what you are thinking, then you can come arrive at this thinking that, well, we will just make it worse for everyone, but uh, at least we can listen into everyone. Uh, that can quickly become, what's this, the, the wilderness of mirrors, what was the term, a labyrinth of mirrors where you don't know what you're thinking yourselves and what the others were thinking. Exactly, and, and there is a Terry Pratchett joke about this with the mirrors and uh, uh, I don't know what, what figure 
I thought that all of you would be laughing now. Okay, well, never mind. Um, anyway, it will explode in their face, the whole thing, and this is clear because uh, if previously many would say, well, this is based on American standard, particularly the NSA has been uh, working on this, of course it's rock solid, they know what they're doing, and no one really thought that maybe they knew too well what they were doing. And now uh, the message is, well, if, if the NSA has been working on it, hmm, then there's probably an extra backdoor in it. Let's take a look. And now not just the crazy people will go looking. But those that were paid, that are paid for it, uh, or that can sell what they found. And if th when these people think that they're the only ones that are paying, well, that is probably the next failure. Well. Ten years ago, who was here? Johnny C3? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess not many will notice that you manipulated the slide. Back then we said there'll be a time when people say, no, it wasn't me, it was my iron. That was 10 years ago. And we weren't that far off. This, this year in Russia they found irons with additional electric devices that try to get into Wi-Fi's and suddenly data. I mean, just think about it, the economy of scale behind that. How many people buy irons? How many of these people have Wi-Fi? How many of these people have anything interesting in their Wi-Fi? And have their, wa their, their iron connected to power in range of the Wi-Fi? Well, okay, within range of Wi-Fi, Okay, let's just ask around. Show of hands. Who of you has an iron? Okay, lots of people. Who's ironing more than, say, two hours a week? <laughs> okay. That's not so many. So lots of people have an iron, but it's only running two hours per week. No, they didn't mention anything about batteries. No, no it sure doesn't have an, a battery. Batteries are so expensive, you know. And then just imagine they they put a lithium-ion battery into the uh, iron. What could possibly go wrong? Might leave some scorch marks. Okay, so two hours per week, a thing has power. It can get into the Wi-Fi. Who among you is still seeing unprotected Wi-Fi networks when ironing? Yeah, quite a few, huh? And it seems to pay off. Putting an iron on the market that has power for two hours per week and maybe or maybe not find the Wi-Fi that it can actually access and then send spam or whatever these things were doing, and it, it pays off. Yeah, I mean, hotels, of course, maybe. But yeah, I think that's, that's valuable information that it's actually worth it. So then the question is, is it a case like with uh, LG and their smart TVs, the LG TVs are phoning home, they tell them what apps you're running, what you were watching, and what the file names and memory sticks were. I mean, it's purely for statistical purposes, of course. So when that came out, they said, yeah, uh, no, we, we, we do need that information. It's an important, uh, important functionality to improve the customer experience. And then they released a new version, and that then didn't lock quite so much data anymore. So we thought, okay, well, maybe they just uh, improved, their, they increased their profits a little by selling the data. And 
maybe the the manufacturers of uh, household appliances do the same thing now. Uh, we we can sell this iron for more than twelve dollars. So let's just add a Wi-Fi chip for fifty cents and sell the results for sixty. Profit. And I mean, if you look at it that way, you know, a few years ago, three years ago, the Internet of Things. All devices will be intelligently networked and do great things with us or for us. And well, that's not what people had in mind, Wi-Fi in your iron. I mean, I'm sure you can do more things here. If any other ideas where you can add Wi-Fi. Did anyone say a laundry machine? Ah, fridge. Yeah. Does any of you have a laundry machine with Ethernet connection? And there's actually a few hands in the audience. Gas heating. Yeah, yeah. No, we have that later. Sex toy with Bluetooth? Oh, not as shy. Anyway, so 10 years ago we knew we can't trust your phone. Who of you trust their phone? Well, three, four, maybe five people. So you have a Nokia 1011 or something? Yeah, it's hard, huh? So back then, the internet almost ended because of email and spam. And so we thought, fax is going to come back. I mean, who of you doesn't have a fax? And there's a number of hands. <laughs> okay, well, maybe. So who of you still has a fax device? Significantly fewer people. I'm... I don't mean an electronic device that speaks the fax protocol. I mean a device where you actually put paper in and it prints stuff on the paper and... Ah, okay. Preferably thermal paper. <coughs> yeah, okay, so the, f the renaissance of fax didn't really happen. So we thought maybe we would get to do a continental blinking lights. And I think it was before we found out how bad it was for SCADA and uh, SCADA connected to the public internet. And we kind of have continental blinking lights, just on a different level. I don't know if you saw the talk, um, if you saw the talk of the guy who sends out the IP packets on a large scale and checks who replies and did it while, um, while it was a tropical storm and to see which countries and continents had outages and well it, it kind of looks like blinking lights on a global scale. We're also seeing lots of potential for smart meters. No, 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 no. That's all, that's all sp stupid. I mean, you fell for the propaganda. I have a smart meter now. It can't do anything. Now you unpack it and it's called electronic uh, power meter, some people call it smart meter, there's no no common name. You, it's really hard to find out what the thing can actually do and which APIs it's supposed to have and there's S0 and D0 and there's a clock cycle, is it whatever, how many kilowatts per hour. So it comes out of the box and it can't do anything. I mean, at least it can show me the current power use in watts, which is good, so you don't have to count the rotations. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could just use an upper coupler. Now. Now, the upper couplers that existed were all kind of crappy because they didn't have a back channel and you don't, didn't know if the packet arrived or what. And now they have these things with a D0 interface. Uh, it's an optical interface, you just send an email to this one guy and he says um, buy me a thing and so you get this device with the USB connection 
then you need to find software because if you call your utility provider and tell them, ah, oh, I saw in your ad there's a happy family staring at an iPhone and they saw the current power use and there's this white box hanging in the ceiling that's connected to this other white box that was connected to the smart meter and I'd like to have that, please. So I can also sit on my sofa and smile happily and stupidly. I didn't even ask what, it's, what it would cost, I just said I want it. And they said, well, they asked, do you live in Berlin in Mackisches Viertel or in Hafen City in Hamburg in the pilot areas? No. Well, then, no, sorry, can't have it. Okay, but what you're missing is one detail. Why would the utility companies have these smart meters? They don't actually want them, especially the smaller ones. There's only one functionality that they like. And that's the possibility of turning off your power if you didn't pay your bill. And well, But my device can't do that. No, 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 okay, your device can't do that yet, but that's a something they want, um, so-called subscriber management, as it's called. So as soon as you don't pay your bills, you actually turn off your power, that would be cool. The only thing this new device does better than the other is it takes more power. That is really the only difference. I still believe in blinking lights, but uh, an important detail about the subscriber management. These devices are being deployed by the million, dozens of millions in Europe. And one of the interesting questions is what happens? Is there any cryptography in there? There's a, there's a key on the front, so there must be crypto in there. Probably certified by the NSA or someone. So, great stuff. And the question is, how much power does it take to turn on the crypto in that? I mean, if you convert that smart meter deployment in Europe-wide, you could probably calculate how much that would rise global temperatures just by turning on crypto on your smart meters. So, so much about crypto. Um, ten years ago, they renamed OpenSSH and OpenSSL. Uh, we, we thought they'd rename OpenSSH and OpenSSL to Wide OpenSSH and Wide OpenSSL. Uh, what just happened? Uh, there was defacing of OpenSSL.org and the random number generator didn't work. Uh, whatever, just, just ignore that for now. Oh, right, yeah, the only good thing you can say is that the elliptic curve dual ECE EBG, EBRG uh, never actually worked and nobody ever noticed, nobody ever complained. Yeah, election computers, electronic voting, still not dead. It's in its dying throes, but it's not gonna be around for much longer. Like, all these topics, they have a tendency to, to come back, to become zombies, and come back with brains. And, well, they would probably return to something like online elections, so already looking forward to that. That would be lots of fun. But something else that was out of public perception for, for a while was source code management systems. Back then, of course, we were talking about CVS. Uh, today we talk about GitHub and these things like just running a search over GitHub code and looking for private key. Ouch. Are they working on some features to reject bad code? Um, I don't think so. Why would they do that? Yeah, they have no reason to do that because then they could just close down. No, but that, that would be useful, right? Maybe they should just turn it into an entertainment program. Uh, earlier at the Congress, uh, a few years back, we had code readings where people sat on the stage and they read their favorite parts of bad source code. I think maybe we should do that again. It could be funny. So what you're saying is we need uh, naming and shaming on GitHub. Well, 
More like, if you commit this code, we will tell all your Facebook friends about it. So you mean, you can commit it, but everyone will know how bad it actually is. Or you just go back and spend some more time on it. What was that? Well, I always dream about seeing really, really badly written software and I think, you know, if I had lots of money, I would like to pay a lot of money to guys like Blackwater and I would ask them to go to the house of the author at 4 a.m. in the night and wake him up with a, with a bucket of ice water and then just read his own code back to him. Well, yeah. Ten years ago, we have said that 1024-bit RSA keys are no longer state-of-the-art. Who of you still has a 1024-bit RSA key? Well, it would be shameful, I will admit that. Does anyone know anyone who still has a 1024-bit RSA key? <coughs> who of you has one of these crypto chip cards? And who of you is sure that there is no 1024-bit RSA on these chip cards? Yeah, they all know that it's way below a 100-bit. Oh well. And we were asking for better uh, routines to do damage, and uh, I guess this is open for debate whether or not we are seeing better routines here. It basically boils down to your computer is locked because of reason X and you will only get it back if you give us a certain amount of money or alternatively all your data has been encrypted and you will only get it back after giving us money. And I've even seen that with a countdown. You have three days, two hours and one minute left. Uh, whoops, now it's three days and two hours and so on. And of course the counter will get back uh, if you can uh, make it plausible that you had need some time to to get bitcoins or whatever it's just struggling with the usability but there have been some innovations here what i really liked was the one uh, by hijacking the browser it would make it look like uh, you are actually getting money from someone and this trojan horse would say there is more money on your on your bank account than you would expect and then there will be a pop-up that says hey uh this was an accident. Uh, I accidentally sent you money and I didn't mean to and please send it back. And then uh, you actually want to give them the money back and nothing will help you. No no two-phase authentication and nothing. And of course the blackmailing routines, they are getting tougher and tougher. They even have pictures of Angela Merkel uh, with a giving you the evil eye. Or maybe sometimes they also simply display the picture that they are currently getting over your own webcam. So that is, that's not so bad. Well, the topic of uh, publishing exploits, we had that 10 years ago. And back then we said, because the software vendors uh, show so little reaction when you try to contact them, when you go to them and say, okay, we found a bug, please fix it, they will all yawn and say, oh, well, maybe later. Uh, we actually asked for more bugs to be published so that the software vendors uh, would get some pressure and well looking at today what is the reaction when you when you uh, when you find a bug and contact the software vendor when, when you do it in the USA the first thing you will get is probably a letter from a lawyer or from a court so all basically boils down to they, they really want you to sell the bucks that you find to the NSA and the community says no more free bucks. They don't longer want to give the information about the bucks to the software vendors for free and the vendors say we don't even want to know about these bucks because otherwise we would have to take care of them. So you know what we will just sue you before you disclose them. So in a way the situation when you compare it to 2003 has gotten worse. I mean there is more stuff that is getting published um, of course, that's also the reason is because there is much more software and much more bugs in that software, but the situation itself has not improved. And as long as nothing happens there, it will not get better. All right, so let's uh, have a look at the Internet Normality Update 2013. Let's see, what is normal right now? Normal is that 
one in four of all Germans do not use online banking because they are afraid of jo Trojan horses. There are 40 to 50 million potential UPnP victims on the internet. Those are the uh, plastic, plastic router zombies. Router zombies, that's a nice way to put it. But uh, on the other hand, the virus scanners are at a detection rate of 100% if you wait for a week uh, before you open the mail, that is. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't open the mail, it had an attachment. Uh, I have to wait for a week. Let it mature for a while. <laughs> yeah, in a way that uh, makes everything uh, less urgent and less hectic. So uh, let everything uh, sit in your inbox for a week before you open it. It was just like in old times when the ship was coming into the harbor. They had to be, uh, for 30 days, they had to be under quarantine. And if in these 30 days there was no major outbreak of an illness on that ship, well, the survivors were basically allowed to, well, go into the harbor. So yeah, let's do the same thing with emails. Let let them uh, sit in your inbox for a week until the virus scan programs are up to date. Of course, you can upload that to the uh, vendors of the antivirus programs, and you have, uh, I think, a detection rate of 21 out of 40 or so. So 47 percent of all internet users have been a victim of of cyber crime. Remark. Something funny, um, what is very interesting, uh, what happens with virus scanners, uh, I thought that by now they will be all top quality and stuff. Uh, well, what made you think that? Um, and there was this older computer that uh, hadn't been at the net for half a year and didn't receive any updates um, and was then going to be reused and was going to be scanned. And, and uh, first of all, three different antivirus makers said there is no virus. Uh, I worked with that thing computer for a while and I thought it's behaving strangely there is a virus there. I then looked a bit deeper and there was a virus there and the virus then was just old. It, it wasn't just old. It, it, it was basically the old configure worm but uh, someone just uh, had, had been meddling around with it. It wasn't exactly the original. But in principle it was configure. It was that code. And uh, neither Avast, well, Avast didn't find it just like that ju initially. Uh, well, I guess the details don't really. Just hurry up a little bit. I've just found that very interesting. I mean, yes, wireless scanners. I think this is uh, an interesting phenomenon. It's a piece of software that uh, loads executables from the internet executes this with a huge or with a very high priority it has access to all parts of your system to all parts of your hard disk um, and you really think this is making you more secure and when you look at the the reports of people who have compared these virus scan programs there are huge lists of vulnerabilities in these virus scan programs because they have these huge lists of signatures and this is complex data formats, so there's, is, there's, there are bound to be some errors. I guess the question is really, when will people start to attack these virus scan programs systematically? Well, actually, that is pretty standard behavior for a Trojan horse right now. There is one, for example, that can give you an error message in 10 different languages, a false error message, and you will get this this false error message in a pop-up box and it'll ask you basically for your password uh, and it needs that password in order to disable the virus scan program. How many of you have been the victim of online crime within the last 10 years? And who knows someone who has been the victim of internet oh, it crime? just changed to very few to about half. 47% sounds like a lot. I think this is even every time someone gets a spam mail and he says, oh, now I've just become a victim of cyber crime, I guess that counts too. Or a mail with, a, with a, an attachment that is a little fishy. I guess these are just numbers by the uh, federal, federal, federal police office. Right. And so let's just ignore those. Maybe just a note to the virus scanners. 
for this year's security nightmares. It's too too great to to uh, not tell it. I had a case where the virus scan program was executing on the laptops of my boss, and it did not recognize the malicious software because the malicious software was sitting inside the signature file of the virus scanner itself. Well, the help is that most virus scanner out there deactivate RSA under Windows, don't they? And uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, identity, identity theft. theft. Um, five percent in the U.S. adults as victims of adult uh, identity theft. Uh, we see a shift from explicit identification to uh, uh, what you call fuzzy identity. Uh, so everything you do and, and where you are with your computer, what networks you're in, uh, what cookies you've collected, uh, all that browser fingerprinting and such uh, history, all that then forms, there are enough bits in there to, to, to map one's identity, to represent one's identity. And uh, we've come to the point uh, where internally uh, some online traders say, well, people won't have to log in with us anymore. We know them from uh, what comes from them until about 50 or 100 euros order of value, we'll just send it to the address where we think <laughs> that, is, that it is theirs. Um, because that's enough as an identity. And, and, and this means that the next step of identity theft will depend on more bandwidth because um, y all that browser image and all that has to be downloaded from that victim's computer to simulate it. Right? Uh, so more bandwidth leads to more identity theft. Some interjection. We have 100 gigabits per second here in this building, by ah. the way. Uh, we'll, we will come to that, yes. I think this will be the finishing, the, the closing event. 95%, uh, 94% of Java plugins out there are outdated. We don't have to comment that, do we? 35% of mobile devices are not password protected in Europe. Well, we'll just leave that without comment. And uh, the large botnets now have more than 1 million bots. These must be the PC-based ones, because router-based should be much, much larger. I don't know what gaming consoles are. Uh, they are all online. Uh, what, 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 what about them? Someone from the audience just mentioned you could get a virus on your iron. Yeah, 10% uh, of German websites are contaminated. That's actually quite a lot. Uh, the US, in the US, this is supposed to be less. I don't know. Adblock uh, is a security measure. Uh, if someone from the press asks why we're using Adblock, it's for security. And there's one thing I wanted to just uh, complain about with with the UPnP uh, problem with 40 to 50 million potential victims, uh, routers on the external interface uh, offer these uh, um, functions. And, and the interesting thing is that uh, those 200 makers, if you look at them, 75% uh, of those simply use four different development kits. So there's a monoculture here of development kits for this UPnP protocol that everyone uses and that has ancient code on it. F fixes have been around for two years when this was discovered, disclosed. So these are just not up to date. Okay. What about e-government? What happened this year? Quite a bit. Well, evaluation of Twitter, Facebook at demonstrations. Um, that, I think, has become a standard uh, to evaluate social media. Everyone does that. We are waiting for the sock puppet counter movement. Um, if suddenly on Twitter everyone says we're now turning right and they actually turn left, or um, two million sock puppets say 
we'll go demonstrating in Berlin tomorrow. It's not like uh, you cannot buy these things. A small donation campaign, crowdfunding or something, uh, cheaper than buying demonstrators or Facebook friends. Uh, Facebook friends is actually cheaper. So, well, of course, that will become conspicuous, won't it? What else came out? Stuxnet has been around since 2007. Those are the interesting things, right? If you think something's coming around the corner and it's huge and no one's seen it coming, uh, talking, talking of something words. coming around the corner, <laughs> Constance is walking up, <laughs> delivering something. A brown envelope. Mm. Let's continue. I'll just look into that envelope. Uh, so Stuxnet 2007 proves one thing that uh, every architect and software de developer knows a large working system used to be a small functioning system and in fact the more modern parts of Stuxnet was not as beautiful as the old one just as with buildings actually camera looking over the shoulder now as I was not able to see if no whether no that was a previously invasion uh, so something will have to be learned there something some lessons haven't been learned yeah. uh, interesting uh, speaking of e-government this was actually a, 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 an appropriate leak it's about a statistic a statistic how many people uh, have actually activated their EID function in the German biometric passport. Bavaria is in front, the federal state, uh, with 30%. The other federal states, between 20 and 30%. And uh, it's more in the cities, but there are uh, ID authorities that have less than 10%. That must be at the local government level, I guess. And uh, for some reason, uh, there is a, a strongly falling trend about activating that EID. Interesting. What could possibly be the reason? Let me think. You have a product and it doesn't sell. Who is at fault? The sellers. In this case, the employees of the authorities that hand out these IDs, uh, they, well, there's obviously um, this, uh, every technology needs the time, needs time to actually uh, pull through and of course they have to do this now and uh, it's not <coughs> easy ah that ID is valid for 10 years even if the applications are limited think of tomorrow and uh, if you only activate that functionality in a few years it'll cost extra beautiful and uh, please um, put up banners in the offices, obviously a uh, directive to those employees, um, great. 30% uh, doesn't sound like uh, e-government breakthrough is imminent. Uh, who of you has this EID uh, function activated in their ID? No hands at all, I think. Oh, I think I saw one right there. One or well, two, maybe. Of course, there are several motivations to do that. Uh, for research reasons, that's completely legitimate. So uh, let's just hang on. Uh, let me quote: "You do have to do this, and th nothing is going to happen to you without knowing your PIN. No one can use your ID on the internet. Just dare." Why didn't you read this? This is uh, this is the best part. Uh, chain, don't change your transport pin today. You can y keep this letter closed until you, you need it, and then nothing can happen. <laughs> so uh, my personal part is, uh, if someone wants to do this. Uh, Please look for an, a trustworthy notary and and let them keep it, uh, so at least so that at least you can have you have something to prove. 
probably more than just the more than the whole ID card. Elster, that is the online tax uh, declaration system. They have moved away from Java. Now, this will raise the gross national, pro national product by 2%. I have no doubt at all. Have you ever used this? Do you know how slow it is and how fast it now is without Java? Okay, again, I didn't hear this again. Someone's racing towards the microphone. Right, test, yeah. Uh, once upon a time, uh, December came and I considered doing my tax declaration for last year, that's the deadline. Um, and I took this huge pile of paper and, and sat down in front of my browser and, and opened the Java-based Elster application. Took about three hours to fill in that form electronically. And then something happened in between. I, I, a meal probably, I went to the kitchen uh, and then it suddenly said your 30 minute timeout has expired. So this strange Windows Elster form did actually work in the end. I tweeted this and uh, someone replied, I know this problem, I was working in, 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 in a company that did this app for the unemployment uh, authority and, and it works the same way. And no, you cannot save. After 30 minutes, the whole data is just gone. According to our definition, uh, that is progress. Uh, progress is reverse progress. Now, from reliable sources uh, that you do sometimes have, it looks like um, they, the finance authorities are changing their structures to become Microsoft Cloud capable, which of course is uh, some progress. Yes, particularly with open data and transparency. <laughs> Unfortunately, with the wrong people, transparent to the wrong people, but you have to go with the times and use modern standards. Yeah. Who of you has killed the RFID chips in this room? Oh, uh, quite a few hands. How many of you have a password protected RFID chip in, in their ID card or who knows someone who still has an old one and that's the vast majority almost everyone including this translator by the way so um, uh, yes you can still hand it in as you rent a pedalo or uh, use a microwave to disinfect it and uh, this ID card does not indicate that you cannot put it into a microwave for, disin microwave for disinfection. So um, y you should be very careful beforehand in experimenting because the chip rather quickly gets rather hot and uh, there's a surprisingly large burn hole. Well, um, I heard of someone, yeah, so scrapping hardware because it's contaminated by software, that has been the trend for a while now. And since everyone these days, uh, every hardware these days is software, if you just look at a notebook, this consists of uh, roughly 30, 40 different computers uh, which are all working away, camera controller, microphone controller, USB controller, t keyboard controller, display controller, and so on and so on and so forth. So all these things can compute by themselves and one of them, if one of them is contaminated, you cannot just de decontaminate them all. So um, I'd say that h scrapping hardware because the software isn't trustworthy anymore should be a more frequent thing to, to experience and particularly there's a been interesting detail that I was told about telephones. Um, there are chips in those that do power control that to make care, take care that everything is powered up and down and um, 
these cost money and and the trend increasingly is that uh, these chips uh, are mostly replaced by the main processor the physical hardware is there but the control is done of, of the whole power thing is done by the processor and and that in in turn uh, is uh, is responsible for, for software so uh, for security reasons, I guess large parts of telephones or PC flotillas uh, can be bricked through software uh, so that they don't pose a security risk anymore. Are you talking about plastic routers? No, that's what you said. Or did you say LG tele TVs? That's what you said. Yeah, interesting question. So the thing about scrapping contaminated PCs, uh, we are way ahead there. This happened in Schwerin in northern northeastern Germany and in the US. Uh, in the US, one authority with uh, this measure, measure simply destroyed $2.7 million and only stopped when they went broke. That's what we call commitment to security. In Schwerin, uh, after 170 computers and 190,000 euros replacement costs, they stopped. So that's what can happen to you these days with these things that that have been popped uh, that have popped up this year. What was this? Intel Advanced Management Technology. IPMI is the protocol. IPMI, yeah. Do you know IPMI? Do you know what it is? IPMI. If you don't know it. It's the management interface of your server and your computer with its naked ass is on the internet. Uh, if you just look at the main boards of large makers, uh, typically uh, about 30 remote exploits uh, ha are fixed in one go. Uh, this has happened with one manufacturer and these had been open for years. And uh, if you go around, you can still see them. Uh, the ports are fairly well known. And if you can just poke around a bit and the whole thing falls apart rather quickly, you can uh, operate the BIOS software update. You can power up and down or uh, all very convenient and practical. One of these is from Inter, right, from 2008. And you do ask yourself, are they sitting there in, in a meeting room hysterically laughing and thinking, well, we'll take a small PC or ARM core and, and let's put an old Linux on that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, what else? Uh, let's um, DMA, put DMA on the, to the RAM. What could possibly possibly go wrong? And for it, for it to be user friendly and, and cheap, uh, let's uh, on the same Ethernet port, let it listen uh, on the same port where uh, when a plug is plugged in and let it uh, uh, grab an DHCP address and every packet, uh, uh, what you want to call the application processor, the actual main processor, let them evaluate all those packets. Yeah. So um, you just have to uh, just imagine the James Bond villain uh, with this. Um, so what could possibly go wrong? Uh, let's just do it. Yeah, and that's it. Seems that seems to be in computers now that you buy in the stores. Um, we had uh, talked to an angel that uh, had no other explanation. Uh, uh, the PC uh, he couldn't just get the PC off his mother's computer and and scra scrapped it in the end. Ah, yes, well, they uh, thought at Intel how they could sell more hardware more quickly, of course. Why didn't I think of that before? Oh, dear. Well, even nicer uh, when the software actually is update capable and regularly uh, connects to an update server. And the update server then uses Internet Explorer, Internet Information Server 6 as a web server in 2013. Happened at Huawei. Huawei, I don't know. It's a Chinese manufacturer of ah. GSM parts, basically. 
Okay, and then the, the Microsoft, of course, have dedicated servers, I've been told, uh, on which the crash information uh, arrives, the crash dumps that you may be sending them so that they can improve their software. No? No, no. That you hand to the NSA so that you can get targeted better, so that they can burn control CDs from that or uh, whatever you have as modus operandi as a target. Um, yes, medicinal devices, you know them, we all know them. Uh, mostly, uh, if you're in hospital and you have an ethernet socket next to you and are bored, right, so, um, actually quite scary even if you don't do anything and just keep looking uh, what you can see the slide says warning about 300 medicinal devices from 40 manufacturers so you'd rather go playing Tetris uh, you, there are things you don't want to know there was a warning uh, they say it now for about 300 minutes medicinal devices with Ethernet uh, interfaces from 40 manufacturers and this was all about fixed passwords, pre-stored passwords, not even outdated software. Uh, and then the subject of bad evil defaults uh, starts with small evil defaults in browsers, uh, whether it's about third-party cookies being accepted or not, that's the small defaults that you get right or wrong the content of the certificate store, uh, which root certificates do you trust, uh, that uh, to me is part of evil defaults. Yes, of course, surely. And then it gets uh, interesting, uh, who on the basis of their self-selected defaults uh, perhaps falls really down hard on their faces, uh, the RSA company, for example, who, as we could read at Reuters, uh, had received $10 million to have eSafe with a bad default, their product, an evil default, it has to be said. Yes, it, there are bad defaults, uh, which either were or have become bad, and then there are the malicious ones. And that's why we're waiting, because uh, we do believe in balancing justice. Even in 2013, we're waiting for the headlines that with eSafe, they had ceded their own keys as well. Right, we don't know, but it's, it's actually quite close no, it's, it's it's quite uh, it's a safe assumption. Safe basically. assumption, yeah, yeah. Well, what else did we have? Well, biometry, biometrics, right? biometrics. I'm sorry, this is one of the interesting topics. Who of you is doing that? This huge worldwide biometrics experiment called Touch ID. All right, Starbucks has participated. And this ended rather quickly. I think it hit the stores on Friday, those few stores where you could actually buy this thing. And I think by Sunday, everything was, everyone had forgotten about it. But the really important question has never been answered. Who has managed to, to get one of these things in their hands on the Saturday? So I guess there was the uh, German publisher Heiser, I think they have gotten one of these in their hands. Might have been a cooperation with a company from Taiwan. But what's really interesting about this whole story is something different. Biometrics is, well, everyone was saying, well, this again, we, uh, we thought we broke all this 10 years ago. But we always tend to, after, after having broken such technology, we tend to not look at it anymore and forget about it. And what Apple then did was, well, you have to give it to them. They tried to make it as good as possible, but they, for example, 
did something that many others have never done and will probably never do, which is do the matching of your fingerprints in the phone. So they did not do it in the cloud, as far as we know. But then what happened, because Apple is of course the market leader, or well, maybe not the market leader, but the coolness leader, many other manufacturers that take the second or third place in the market, they also want to implement these fingerprint sensors in their phones. And those are mostly vendors who are using Android. And what they all have in common, if they think they can save a tenth of a penny somewhere, they will probably go for it. Because the profit rates for these phones are pretty low. And a chip that is doing match on chips, so matching the fingerprint on the telephone and not on the cloud, is simply more expensive. So we can safely assume that Apple has opened Pandora's box with this Touch ID. And we will see a lot of phones in the next year that have fingerprint readers. And I guess it's it'll probably going to be as broken as Touch ID or even more broken because the resolution is probably going to be worse. But the matching will probably not be done in the in software on the phone, but it will use cloud services for that. So the whole thing with the Touch ID that was opening the uh, biometric Pandora box and we will see what this brings us next year. What you're assuming that other vendors can get it right, well, yeah, well, there's always hope. One of the cooler things we saw this year was this drone that enslaved other drones. Well, it was just uh, flying around and it was basically looking for SSIDs of other drones. And then brute forces the WPA encryption of the other drone's Wi-Fi kicks off the pilot, the, uh, the, uh, the user of the drone, and then sends commands to the drone that it has just owned. There is a very nice video on YouTube. This is, it's worth watching. Yes, it was, could, couldn't make a what the guy in the audience was saying, but what you can do when you invest a little time on a nice Saturday afternoon, you can go in a park and actually hijack an entire swarm of drones. Once again, please. Well, Amazon, yes, they are using drones now as well. Or, well, they're not using them yet, but it remains to be seen if they're going to be using them. I think we'll rather use our uh, our raw post. What's the uh, the tube uh, post? Or oh, yeah, the tube post as a delivery system. I don't know whether right. that's called, what that's called, what we saw at the Congress. Right, and some time ago, a uh, friend of mine, we just had to charge his phone, so we simply attached it to a USB charger. Who of you has a good feeling when he attaches his phone to a USB charger? Well, we have seen chargers that actually send exploits to phones. We're living in times where all these chips are much too cheap. You can easily add it to a, to a charger. And basically what you have to do is you have to have a sealed, uh, sealed piece of luggage with all your hardware so in order to avoid your hardware getting in contact with other malicious hardware. Or you see on the airports, you see these pillars with the USB ports. Oh, I was wondering, is anyone actually using those? Oh yeah, you see a lot of people there. Well, I guess we should put some up right here. Then there is this very interesting report about uh, controlling the smartphones of drivers is for, for German uh, drivers in particular. Good catchy word now, <laughs> it's car very drivers, catchy. is actually allowed if you are assuming that the driver is doing something wrong. So what do you have to assume that the driver is doing? I mean, it's not speeding, obviously, so maybe he has something on his phone that will warn him against speed traps or something like that. If you're assuming that, you can just uh, seize his phone and, and check it. Well. 
browsers and operating system vendors have been disabling Java. This is an interesting phenomenon of self-defense, really, that, uh, that we are witnessing here. And uh, if we take this a little further, uh, will we actually eventually see uh, someone going out there and disabling all these plastic routers because of security reasons? Who knows? Uh, USA uh, injecting data wirelessly? Well, who knows if there is really any meat to that story here, so let's just skip it. Trojan horses go into stealth mode. Disguising themselves. And of course we have Ethernet adapters that can also host Trojan horses. One of the more interesting things this year was the Internet census. They actually wanted to go through the entire internet and evaluate a lot of things. We have read about this in academic research projects uh, who try to do this or have been doing this, and we read about the NSAs doing this as well. They're actually charting the internet and creating maps and see what is where. And we had something interesting sent to us. Uh, someone actually did this from from here crawling through the entire internet from, from this building. I mean, why do we have these 100 gigabits per second pipes? And uh, I think he was only scanning for one port. And simply tried to... It, it was the VNC port, so whenever someone was actually offering uh, to, to share the screen without a password, they could just take control over the screen. And what we then received were a couple of screenshots, and we made a, sp a short movie out of these screenshots. You have to look closely. <coughs> so that's how it starts. I'm waiting for my screen to turn <laughs> up. And what I find interesting is that these seem to be BIOS screens in there. I want some porn. <laughs> Who doesn't? So we're seeing all sorts of things here. So it looks like it's not just the typical Windows machine that is no, sharing no, their not screen. At all. Wasn't there a, a thing about? Uh, power stations. Yeah, this looks like industrial domestic stuff. Domestic heatings. W this is a clock of some sort. Silo 31, Silo 32. This is not official, not on the record. It's just a translator speculating, not yes. the talk. Back to the talk. Now, an interesting contrast to the talks that we have been hearing that were basically talking about the advanced techniques that NSA and other agencies were using and also what advanced techniques against current security measures uh, could be found, such as randomization measures and other things. How to, how to bridge the air gap, basically, so uh, uh, be able to connect to machines that are not connected to the Internet in one way or the other. And then you just go through the Internet and basically knock on every door, you don't even try to open the door, but you basically look through that little window on the door and that is what you see. And uh, apparently sometimes you see the power button for a huge uh, diesel generator. Or the water supply of whatever city that may have been. Or uh, systems where you can adjust the level of chlorine in a public bath or uh, something else. Banking software that is just processing uh, sums of several hundred thousand euros and so on and so forth. Facebook logins, camera footage, online poker, that was also something nice. People actually looking into each other's cards in online poker. I mean, you, you look at this and you, 
You think I don't even want to see anything. I don't want to see more. I, th that is enough. Please stop it. I... I don't think I could get a good night's sleep if I watched 100 or 120 screenshots like that. So is this all malicious hardware? Uh, well, I saw a website recently. I uh, forgot. Uh, something. Someone's done the same with webcam surveillance webcams, and that had some funny things in it as well. I think there were 300, 400 videos, uh, cameras that you could switch on and off. Uh, I think that was an art installation. Uh, yeah, I think these was these were public cameras. Uh, this was there are many ten thousands of those. Uh, it's actually. Uh, by design that you can connect to these. But what it shows is that when the the uh, the amount of unsafe technology or the, 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 the is so widespread that when you find one, you can find thousands. So it's, it's not like you can rely on the fact that, well, who is going to find this behind that one IP address? There is no leak that would point to this particular camera, but if you have 100 gigabit connection, or even if you just have a one gigabit connection, it suddenly is not such a big problem anymore to just try out every single IP address that there is and just try to probe them, so. No, this was um, a provider who said that their cameras uh, through a website could be accessed from any place in the world. And these were residents that had these webcams in their uh, homes or in clubs. Uh, I clicked through this for about a night, I think, and I, I switched it off because it just became too embarrassing because these virus tendencies I could not stand. I, I could not in <laughs> endure. Well, yes. I mean, of course, you, c you can, uh, for example, just extract your typical strings out of a management software of these cameras and put them into Google and you will find thousands of of web interfaces for these cameras and half of them will not even have a password. So there are many of those out there, but I think the difference between looking at a webcam and adjusting the chlorine level in a public swimming pool, there is a difference between those two. Well, yes, malicious hardware, we already covered irons. We have evil SD card controllers. Uh, this was one of this Congress's talks where I thought, oh, maybe gardening work would not be such a bad idea, or maybe do some carpenting or something like that. Because many people uh, are starting to distrust USB sticks and SD cards, uh, seem to be trustworthy, but, uh, well, unfortunately it turns out they're not. And what they can do with the data stream that goes in and out, they can basically do anything. They can attach viruses to PDF files, or they can say that the card is only two gigabytes, even though it really has four and have something in a secret area that the user cannot see and write something to that area. So there is a lot of things that you can do with that. Yeah, and uh, one of the things we will see in 2014 is the introduction of UFI trusted boot uh, with which you can do great things uh, loadable modules you don't have to flash the whole bios anymore you just can uh, load a module afterwards and that will of course be good for the services too the nsa module is first loaded and then the bnd the german secret services module and uh, then the russians turn it's the russians turn and uh, don't do you know the itu standards for telecommunication uh, the lawful interception there, uh, surveillance, there is a standard for it, and it says that at least the technical uh, conditions have to be met uh, for uh, several services uh, independently being able to observe you, monitor you, without uh, the services noticing who else is listening or the one, p the person being listened to. So if it's more than five, uh, what then should happen is not rigidly defined. There apparently are cases where this happened and uh, you, keep, you then ask yourself, what about computers? If there are more than five people in the BIOS <laughs> stepping on each other's toes, uh, imagine Jake, uh, I'm sure it's getting quite tight on his computer. Yeah. One of the essential things in 2014 will be the problem that we 
keep learning about uh, all kinds of side channels exist that make it possible to break crypto, uh, starting with microphones, acceleration sensors, uh, with which you can snorkel passwords, sound, uh, or what the power converters at the CPU are doing. There are all kinds of possibilities of attack on uh, on computers that you and 10,000 open VNC websites, uh, just compare that with a crypto attack, uh, getting a key from the sound of a power converter. So the, the spectrum of what we're talking about, the range, uh, but clearly controlling sensors will be a main problem in security. Um, if you, the passphrase you enter um, is being snooped upon, can be listened to by a telephone that just happens to be lying on the same desk, but with a distance of one meter, uh, then surely you don't need to break crypto anymore because you just get the passphrase. And if we have, if, we're, if we say evil hardware, malicious hardware, we actually mean malicious software because what is these days, what these days is hardware or software, it's just uh, hardware executing stuff, and and because of that, the question is, where is the JTEC? Isn't it? Or the SPI? Evil networks. Uh, this internet zombie database thing, or potential zombie database thing, that will now start to fill. There are nice projects there, uh, CVI vulnerability or CVE vulnerability database, link that to an internet census, keep that updated. And uh, with the next zero day exploit, you immediately know where to go if you want a million zombies or something. One of the classic things that we've had for a while are the uh, baseboard apocalypse uh, chips on mobile phones, but we kept saying not this year, but I think this time in 2014 it could happen. There are several factors uh, in favor of it. Uh, base stations that uh, w with which you could attack a basement uh, are now ubiquitous and qu rather cheap. And in those basements you have all kinds of things now, all kinds of things from language recognition through video decoding. And, uh, and we have a monoculture because 90% of all those things uh, have chips from from Qualcomm, the manufacturer. Qu yeah, so w you've seen uh, everyone's using the same thing. We've seen that before. Uh, you sit on the same link as the application processor. Mm, so the same thing as with a PC, uh, with an MMI or something interface, and that of course is an enormously ju juicy target. Uh, which makes you ask, why hasn't anything happened before? Uh, that kind of thing could send text messages that can become expensive. It could produce uh, minutes on premium lines or something without the user noticing. Last year, we, we were saying that what still protects us is, a, is the battery time um, isn't enough. Uh, people would notice when the thing is contaminated because their batteries run out quickly. But the point is that these baselines uh, drift everywhere. They get into devices that are always powered and uh, through mains. And even if it's an iron, now you get these chips glued on. And, and if you put that all together and, and, and stir it round in a pot and uh, ask yourself what comes from that, I th and I think that's the baseband apocalypse, uh, which is now imminent. We will see. We have only been wrong by about 10 years in the past. New business areas. What do we have there? Uh, one of them, one of, uh, with bankruptcies, uh, of course, you get certificates, don't you? Um, so if you look, what, uh, what did you say last year? We said buy domain names from bankruptcies to deliver malware from, from those. Well, we didn't think that through. Malware, serve malware, and now certificates from the, those same bankruptcies uh, you don't you can sign, and uh, that gets us back to that signature apocalypse. 
and uh, we would like to come back to that absolutely epic Bugzilla threat. Uh, Honest Ahmed used cars and certificates. You should all read up on that again. Epic. Now, Honest Ahmed uh, with his used car dealership and his certificates. And that gets us back to the point where reality cannot be distinguished from uh, from satire anymore because this year a signed Trojan appeared. I think Diggy Cert signed it and the signature was from um, a car dealer. That didn't exist anymore, that had gone bankrupt. Yeah, used cars and certificates. Yeah, fishing Proofread phishing mails. Proof, phishing mail proofreaders, new business area. So we all know uh, after studying, it's kind of difficult to find a job. Uh, you have to go astray to some uh, exotic fields. So blackmail Trojans need specialists too that take care that the Trojan is working as efficiently as possible. So uh, blackmail Trojan psychologist is another area and search machine query mixer doesn't that exist yet surely i can buy this as a commercial product because if, if i look at the way that some companies worry that someone might notice what's happening in their research department and still they all used google uh, the researchers in those companies all use google to find out uh, how they could solve their current problems surely every question to google is an answer to google as well and surely you want to put that through a mixer. New trend sports. The last uh, section as always. So we have the, the light sports such as uh, drive around with an open Wi-Fi access point and see who actually connects. Or um, how many irons are there? Um, and that is something like uh, you always you keep hearing about young people these days don't get around as much as they used to. You used to be in the country, and uh, uh, you just ran across the fields with us with a butterfly net. And we at the coastline, we threw, went through the waves with a, a small net and looked what was inside. And that's what you do these days with the Android tablet that you got for Christmas with at, at the age of 12. Now, now, open data sensor networks. We did say we need more open data, we need more sensor networks, and you ask yourself wh whether you really want them, but we have to do baselining um, we, because we'll never find what's normal. And to find out what's normal, uh, that's something for 2014 that's very urgent, read more log files or let more software read log files because if you look closely uh, the large a large part of what we've seen and read and what the in nsa is interested in uh, what they are doing in the networks uh, redirecting traffic and be quicker than the, the adversary and um, or the one that you're trying to impersonate so you all find that as traces in log files particularly if you have log files aggregated from different places so with timing and all that, you can find all kinds of different things, interesting things. Um, so recommendation here, if you have, a, if you're in board, if you're a board academic, uh, need a new PhD topic, uh, search out some, some large ISPs to do some data mining on the log files to see what kind of things happen there that do not belong there. And if that's too logical to you and too abstract and too screen oriented, then if you want to be more hands on and use a soldering iron, there still are, or now there are, finally, military surplus infrastructures, not just trousers, but, but bowls and uh, other stuff that um, with which you can do things. And you find this on scrap heaps of this world by now or on eBay and in geostationary orbits. Uh, even in those orbits, there is a lot of surplus hardware that's not getting used anymore. 
So there's still potential there. There is a lot to do. Exactly. So with that, we come to the end. And we wish you all, as always, a good new year into 1984.